Before we get into this video about treatment intensity, I wanted to remind you that on March 11th, we have a free in-person prostate cancer patient and caregivers conference. You can come to Los Angeles, meet other people who are going through a similar journey and ask your questions in person. Check out the link below and I hope you enjoy this video. So today, Dr. Scholz, we're talking about prostate cancer treatments and the concept of if you do them earlier, do you, you know, are you going to be able to use them later? The whole concept of sequencing is not a typical term that I think prostate cancer patients are familiar with, but obviously with medical coverage and insurance and how the trials are done, there's a lot of talk about that. And there's a lot of options in prostate cancer, no matter what stage you're in. So I thought today we would break down the concept of could you use your treatments earlier uh, in regards to maybe going for a cure versus dealing with what we would consider kind of more like a chronic disease. So first of all, can you describe what sequencing is? Well, sometimes uh, if you're going to be getting combination therapies, um, say radiation plus hormone therapy plus or minus chemotherapy, one reality is that you can't give radiation and chemotherapy at the same time. They have to be given sequentially. So which one comes first? The issue may be negotiable. I mean, it, it's possible sometimes to sequence things either way, but uh, that certainly comes up. The other thing that comes up is historically giving people hormone therapy. There was a very, uh, very specific methodology. You gave 60 days of hormone treatment, then you started the radiation. The subsequent studies actually show that there's a lot more flexibility, that you can start them at the same time, or you can postpone uh, the radiation for greater than 60 days and really not lose any efficacy whatsoever. I think the, the big issue is uh, not so much the sequencing, but deciding do you need that additional treatment? People may go on hormone therapy, have a good response to with the PSA coming down to zero, maybe undergo radiation therapy to a, a high-grade disease or maybe there's lymph node disease. PSA is zero, do you need to do more? People talk about uh, the advantages of early chemotherapy in this setting, but if the PSA is zero, do you wanna add more chemotherapy, more side effects when you already are in a complete remission? And this is not a black and white answer. The, there's a lot of variables that have to be addressed in this situation of you know, the patient's personal goals, um, how elderly are they, do they want to uh, endure some short-term side effects uh, for possibly a somewhat enhanced cure rate. This is the whole issue of combination therapy, sequencing, and sometimes um, deciding to just skip uh, further treatment when you get into a complete remission, or to push ahead and try and squeeze out that last ounce of value of what modern medicine can offer. So you mentioned a concept that I don't think is often thought of when it comes to cancer in general, the patient's personal goals. Now obviously when someone gets cancer, they don't wanna have cancer and usually that is the goal, but I think in prostate cancer, it's so different from other types of cancers because it is more slow growing, there's a lot of different options. So can you discuss you know, the difference between maybe somebody who wants to save a treatment for later or someone who wants to get cured now and the pros and cons of each side. Right, so I think it's very uh, helpful to realize that prostate cancer is different. We have PSA monitoring. We have a disease that thankfully doesn't usually spread to the, to the brain's lung or liver. Uh, we have very eff effective treatments and uh, this allows some flexibility in treatment choice. If you look at some of the more frightening illnesses like lung cancer and uh, pancreas cancer, the pathway is very well marked out because you're really fighting for survival with every, every, every large or small option that you can ex get access to. The thing that comes up with prostate cancer is that it plays out over so many years uh, and during that time period, Maybe they'll discover new treatments. Uh, maybe someone who is in a complete remission who statistically maybe doesn't have that great a chance for cure will end up being cured. Uh, should we wait and see and find out if they've been cured before we push ahead with even stronger treatments? The argument against that is that if they aren't cured, did they miss an opportunity to cure it by maybe coming in with stronger treatment right up front? So the factors that uh, that you look at in these sorts of in this sort of a decision making process is well, how serious is the disease? If you have one lymph node of spread versus several bone mets, the the man with more bone mets is going to be in a more serious situation, and you would think in terms of stronger treatment. If someone is younger, then has more years of life at risk, then you would think of being more aggressive. If uh, 
On the other hand, the disease isn't quite as concerning. And if someone is somewhat older, then uh, maybe a milder treatment or foregoing certain treatments would make sense. So you mentioned also the concept that now we have a bigger picture, kind of depending on the grade of disease, we now, because of like the era that we're in, have better technology to be able to see where pa patients' cancers are. So can you talk about how PSMA has really changed the landscape of being able to get a clear picture of where patients are at and how that may change treatment decisions now? Well, it's changed it in so many ways. We might not be able to go into all of them right now. But one area that is um, uh, fascinating to me in the early application of PSMA is that men with metastatic disease often are going into a complete remission. So you treat them with a year of hormone therapy, all the spots disappear. Over time, we've seen that some of these people appear to remain in remission for ex very extended periods. And uh, whereas others, if they come out of remission, maybe they only have one or two spots. And historically with metastatic disease, we would always hit these people hard with more hormone therapy, chemotherapy because we assumed there would be additional spots somewhere else and we had to fight this thing tooth and nail. Now we're starting to use a little lighter touch and just radiate the spots. We get a, immediate feedback as to how much, if any, the PSA declines and we can always get another scan in another six months or so and if more things are showing up, maybe that's the time to use stronger therapy. So it's an evolving situation with PSMA but it's a very powerful tool and I think since we have more precise information, that we are um, afforded the opportunity of using less intense therapy. So you would say that because of PSMA, you see that patients are kind of shifting to maybe more a conservative use of treatment and saving those treatments because we now can monitor it in a much better rate. Yeah, I don't ever think of saving treatments. That's sort of a buzzword with me. The idea of uh, saving treatments is that we have to hold on to stuff for a rainy day. And in the field of oncology, that type of thinking rarely is, is uh, wise. Uh, the only people, I think, that want to do that are the doctors who want, don't want to run out of options and look bad because they don't have something to offer in their services to their patients. Saving treatments is a bad idea, I think, because if something is effective against prostate cancer, it will have more bang for the buck against a smaller, earlier stage cancer than it will against a more advanced stage cancer. So by saving a treatment, you actually reduce the effectiveness of the treatment. So I would never save treatments just because I want to hold on to something for the future. I might postpone a treatment because it's unnecessary or it has too, much, too many side effects for the present tense. But I would not ever save a treatment. How would you say that quality of life plays in regards to the concept of maybe being more conservative versus more aggressive? Well, it's really the big, the big issue because if you have a completely non-toxic treatment that can improve your cure rate 1%, why not do it, if, assuming cost is not prohibited? So it really is all about quality of life. And sometimes where people are on the fence with a uh, decision about a treatment, for example, if someone has uh, one but bone metastasis when they're early at an early diagnostic stage, they go on hormones, they radiate the spot, they radiate the prostate, they're in remission, should they based on some studies, uh, go forward with some kind of chemotherapy, such as Taxotere. For people who are sitting on the fence, I would recommend that they try one treatment with Taxotere and see how they feel. Some people will breeze through it. Others will have more difficulty and perhaps decide that's enough for me. The advantages really aren't great enough to outweigh the disadvantages. Whereas the person who just breezes through the treatment say, What's the big deal? This is covered by my insurance. It'll, it may improve my cure rates 10, 15%. Let's keep going. It really comes down to quality of life as the major issue in deciding about whether or not to pursue these more aggressive options. You know, when you and I are talking, we're talking about multiple treatments, and a lot of times in community settings, patients are not being offered these treatments, or multiple treatments. They're kind of maybe in a position where their physician's giving them one way or the highway or maybe one or two options. What would you say to those people in community settings when there are so many options in prostate cancer and there is different tactics that you can take depending on what your priorities are. Um, what would you say to those patients and how to get access to maybe somebody who can offer them more? Well, I think the most important thing is what my old writing partner, Ralph Blum, said is that you really can't be intimidated by your caregivers. You have to defend and look out for your own health and your own future. It's not that they're bad people, but they're busy. They may have uh, other things on their mind and really don't have time to think through 
and give you an extensive list and ha discuss all these options with you. The uh, warning sign for these doctors that maybe are not optimal is that they tend to have a sort of a one-size-fits-all approach. Doctors that are uh, truly expert at anything will be able to see an, a problem from different angles and be able to listen to your own quality of life priorities and talk about how to scale up or intensify treatment to improve cure rates or how to scale down or, or um, minimize uh, treatment to, uh, to reduce side effects and, and be able to explain the amount of augmented cure rates or the amount of diminished cure rates that will result from these choices. That way patients can participate in the decision-making process and decide how much are they willing to undergo to achieve a specific end. And uh, it's sad that many times people just defer to the expert, say this, this man knows so much more, this man or woman knows so much more than I do. I, I want to simply uh, submit to their treatment plan. But I think it's wise to push back a little bit and ask for, well, if we wanted to go to the next level, what would that entail? Or if we wanted to back off a little, what would that entail? And there should be a plausible answer to that question. Do you suggest that every patient goes to get a second opinion from multiple physicians? Maybe. I think the issue more is to try and make a, a real good judgment as to the quality of the doctor that you're speaking with. And I don't mean that they're not all good people. What I mean is that some doctors are more narrowly specialized. Some are better communicators. Some have uh, conflicts of interest. Uh, maybe they just do one thing and that's what they're trying to push, either overtly or covertly. So I think that looking at those issues, just like we would try and pick a good electrician or a good plumber, uh, a good painter for our house, look at their references, look at, look at uh, where they're coming from, and uh, try and find quality doctors uh, because th there's a big disparity between those that are at the top and those that aren't. I think that when patients are considering chemo or radiation or maybe using some of these treatments earlier on, the thought process is, can I use chemo again? Can you re-radiate? Is there other options down the line in their heads if something doesn't work out and I'm going to use this option now? Is that a possibility? Rarely. In the old days, uh, radiation was a problem because this, the dosage wasn't strong enough to promise you that it would sterilize that spot. And everyone was aware of the fact that you couldn't come back and retreat that same spot. That thinking is actually past now. The radiation these days is powerful enough to sterilize the uh, cancer metastasis almost 100% of the time. And interestingly, even in men that have had previous radiation, if there's been some period of time before the cancer comes back, men that had radiation of yore that wasn't as good, you can re-radiate, uh, oftentimes very successfully. The idea that we're burning bridges is um, not very representative of the situation. Uh, there is the issue with chemotherapy in men with advanced disease that if it stops working, we're not usually thinking of circling back to using it again a couple years later. The fact that the cancer had learned how to leapfrog over that treatment usually means that, that uh, you'll have to move on to other options in the future. So what about in cases with hormone therapy? Because I see a lot of guys move on and sometimes hormone therapy stops working but they're still taking it. So what do you do in those situations? Well, different doctors have looked at that differently. Um, I tend to key off of what's been a pretty standard practice for over 25 years, which is if PSA levels start rising and the cancer starts growing while someone is taking Lupron, we generally continue giving the Lupron. Why would we do that? It stopped working. Isn't it not, not helping anything? Well, it turns out that metastatic prostate cancer is a multi-clonal disease. So although you can detect uh, that some of the cancer is growing because of the rising PSA or the progressing scans, uh, there are still uh, other cells that are being suppressed by the low testosterone uh, situation. And the usual policy is to continue Lupron to help those other sleeping cells stay asleep. And I've expanded that same thinking with second generation hormone therapies like Extandi, Zytiga, uh, Nubeca, and Erlita. The same issue we know occurs where you can have multiclonal disease where these medicines, if they stop working, are possibly still suppressing other clones. 
which we don't want to wake up and get those growing as well by stopping the treatment. So that's been my policy. It seems I'm just being consistent with what's been going on in the prostate cancer world for 25 years by continuing Lupron. But interestingly, perhaps because these are somewhat expensive treatments, many of the centers will stop Xtandi or stop Zytiga if the PSA starts rising. Sometimes they'll switch to another type of a medicine, which rarely can help, but uh, more often I'll see if someone's gonna go on Taxotere or Provenge or some other uh, subsequent therapy, Lutetium, Zofigo, uh, they'll stop the Xtandi or Zytiga. Uh, I typically will continue it because even though some of the clones are growing, others are still being suppressed. I think that when patients watch this video, sometimes I get comments and they're saying, well, what he's talking about is really for intermediate risk, and I wouldn't have options because maybe I'm Gleason 9 or I'm metastatic. So can you contextualize that, you know, when you're talking about these different options and using them in different forms and holding off treatment or using all of them, is it for every Gleason score, for every you know grade of cancer, or are there certain types, I know we don't talk about Gleason 6 because we don't treat it in that sense, but are there certain types that are more prone to having more options than others? With, again, the advent of these PSMA PET scans, which help you accurately determine if there's any metastatic disease, the importance of Gleason score has been greatly reduced. Gleason was the best way to predict if the cancer is likely to spread or not. So we were doing these calculations and projections. How high is the PSA? How high is the Gleason score? There's a 33% chance of metastasis because our scans were so terrible. We knew that we couldn't trust them. Now with more accurate scans, not perfect, but much more accurate scans, the Gleason score is gonna give you a sense of maybe how aggressively the cancer is behaving, but whether or not it's spreading is sort of a decided issue based on the results of these excellent scans. So I think there's going to be more uniformity in how we treat people based on whether it's metastatic or not, rather than is the Gleason score 7, 8, 9, or 10. Today we talked about the concept of treatment intensity, whether to do everything at once, whether to hold off on some treatments. As you've heard Dr. Scholz say in this video, you have options. And I think I want to remind you that prostate cancer is slow growing, even in advanced forms, and it's so important to make sure that you're in the right stage, to make sure you're in the right treatment, and you're really feeling empowered to make that decision, and that you also are aware of the side effects because we want you to prioritize your quality of life. You've been diagnosed with cancer, that's already intense enough. We wanna make sure that nothing, things don't have to get worse. We wanna prioritize you. You matter, you're not alone. We love you, we care about you. And we wanna make sure that all of this is highlighted so that we contextualize prostate cancer on a bigger scale. We wanna do some of the heavy lifting for you, which is the entire reason why PCRI exists. I understand that it's complicated, but if you need help, please visit our website, PCRI.org. We have a wealth of information there. We do have individual prostate cancer facilitators who have been educated by our medical oncology team, and they can help kind of decipher and get you through some of these questions. We want to make sure that the interactions you're having with your medical team, that you feel empowered, that you feel like your questions are being answered, and that you feel solid in the ground that you're standing on, that you're standing on when you're deciding upon a treatment and you know the side effects, and then you know how to mitigate those side effects. We want things to be as optimal as possible for you. Again, we love, we care about you. You are not alone. Please remember that as you go throughout this week. And if you need more help, we're here for you. We appreciate that you trust us.